DiscerningHearts.com presents Wisdom from the Western Isles, The Hermit by David Torkington. David Torkington, the author of The Wisdom from the Western Isles, has re-edited and abridged the work for broadcast. He is also the narrator. The book was originally published as three separate spiritual novels, Peter Calvey, Hermit, Peter Calvey, Prophet, and Peter Calvey, Mystic. We begin with the first part, The Hermit, but including some passages from Peter Calvey, Mystic, so as to give an overall view of the spiritual journey for listeners. We now present Wisdom from the Western Isles, The Hermit, Episode 10, Learning How to Love, narrated by David Torkington. After I said my farewells to Peter Calvey, the hermit who had been such a help to me, Father Callum and I set off for the airport. The plane was held up in Tyree, so while we waited, Father Callum entertained me with stories about the history of Barra, going back to before the Viking occupation. He told me that Christianity had first come to the island about 600 AD, thanks to the missionary zeal of St. Fimbar, also known as Barra from Cork. It was from this Celtic monk that Barra received its name. The Catholic faith had flourished on Barra down the ages, especially through penal times, with the help of Franciscan and Vincentian missionaries from Ireland, when the mainland became mainly Protestant. He knew a lot about the folklore of the island, too, and he had me in stitches telling me about HMS Politician. The story has passed into legend and has been immortalised in the film Whiskey Galore, based on the book by Compton Mackenzie, who lived near the air terminal. The unhappy ship was grounded off the adjacent island of Eriske during the Second World War, with a cargo of whisky bound for the New World. Every sea-going vessel for miles converged on the area. The islanders insisted that their enthusiasm to salvage the cargo was a genuine, if not heroic, attempt to refloat the grounded ship. The scepticism of the authorities changed to incredulity, when they were told that every bottle had to be sacrificed to the sea in a gallant but vain attempt to save the vessel. But eventually, questions were asked about the deeper colour of the domestic water supply. Questions were asked, too, about the sudden wave of agricultural activity that induced otherwise work-shy crofters to plough unproductive land in the middle of the summer. Father Callum was just starting to tell me the story of an islander who hid his quota of whisky in the garage attached to the police station when there was a tremendous roar. The island plane had arrived and thundered overhead as it passed over the car before making his final turn over the Atlantic in preparation for touchdown. We climbed out of the car to watch the landing and had to duck as the plane passed no more than twenty feet over our heads before landing on the beach. I thank Father Callum for his generous hospitality, and ten minutes later the plane took off. At about five hundred feet she banked up, her left wing pointing to the sky. For a few unforgettable moments I had a clear view of Calvey from the plane window. I could see a small, squat little cottage staring out to sea through two tiny windows set deep into the thick walls, proudly refusing to take any notice of the noisy modern machine that roared overhead. To the right of its half-open door, I saw Peter standing motionless, clearly definable against the bright, newly whitewashed walls. His right arm, stick in hand, was raised in a final salute. Suddenly, the plane straightened, and I saw him no more. I opened the present that Peter gave me at my departure. It was a book entitled How to Pray, subtitled A Practical Guide to the Spiritual Life, with an introduction by another hermit, 
Sister Wendy Beckett, who I later discovered was a good friend and correspondent of Peter's. Inside, he wrote simply, For the things I hadn't time to say to you. I had more than enough to think about after my final meeting with Peter, but I did manage to glance at the table of contents to see what Peter meant. One chapter was entitled The Rosary, another The Sacred Heart, and another Traditional Catholic Devotions. I needed to know about these things, as I was already aware that my life was moving in a direction that I had never thought possible before. There was also a chapter entitled From Meditation to Contemplation, one on the mystic way, another on purifying love, followed by the prayer of the heart. So it would help me understand a little better what Peter had been saying that very morning. Many years later, the book was still in print, and a new expanded version is due to be published in the USA by Our Sunday Visitor on the 29th of January, 2021. But for the time being, I needed to close my eyes. However, sleep eluded me, for I could not help going over everything that Peter had taught me, especially that morning. If I wanted to be led into true Christian contemplation, I knew exactly where I had to start after integrating Peter's blueprint for prayer into my daily life. I would have to find time for meditation, not the Indian-style meditation that I had first learnt at Harvard. If what Peter had said had not convinced me, I later read a Vatican document entitled Christ the Bearer of the Water of Life that made everything clear to me. I had, in fact, been practicing a form of meditation that was, to quote the document verbatim, self-centered, directed towards attaining feelings of inner relaxation, peace, and mindfulness, and was totally opposite to authentic Christian prayer. For Christian prayer is, the document continued, not an exercise in self-contemplation, stillness, and self-emptying, but a dialogue of love, one which implies an attitude of conversion, a flight from self to the you of God. Peter convinced me that I had been wrong, that it was only in authentic Christian meditation that I would learn to love God by loving the living embodiment of his love as it was made flesh and blood in the person of Jesus Christ. When I returned home, it was not to the empty house where I turned to drink before, but to the place where I now turn to God in prayer, where I could soon say with St. John Henry Newman, never less alone than when alone. With all that I had learned from Peter, my prayer life began to progress in leaps and bounds. A friend introduced me to the charismatic movement, and I used to go with him to a prayer group once a week. Peter seemed very interested in the charismatic movement, though he frankly admitted that they had no experience of group prayer at all. My initial success at prayer, albeit with Peter's help, gave me a rather inflated idea of my own importance. Since my private prayer became not only easier, but full of sweetness and light, and since I seemed to have all the inspirations in the prayer groups that I led, I began to think that God was especially using me. Then something rather shattering happened— just when I thought I was on the verge of a major spiritual breakthrough, I had a spiritual breakdown instead, or so it seemed. The prayer life that had meant so much to me in the last couple of years had reached a crescendo. It was almost too good to be true. Then the bubble burst, leaving me flat. I just did not know what to do with myself. I tried to use the scriptures in the way I'd become accustomed to using them in my daily meditation, but they left me as dry as dust. Those especially prized passages that used to lift me out of myself into a sort of spiritual euphoria now left me absolutely cold. I tried some of my favorite poems. I tried the hymns that never failed to move me before, but they moved me no more. I felt like a camel lost in the desert. I was living off a hump 
that was becoming smaller and smaller with each passing day. By early spring, I came to realize that I just couldn't go on. I not only felt that my prayer life was in danger, but that even my faith was beginning to falter. It was at this point that I wrote to Peter asking for his help. Dear Peter, something terrible has happened, and I don't know how to tell you about it. Until last September, everything was going according to plan. I really felt that I was getting somewhere at last in the spiritual life. Prayer had become easy to me after those early difficulties that you helped me through. My newfound spiritual energies spilled over into my work, and especially into the prayer groups that I founded and led. Then, Unexpectedly, sometime in September, I seemed to behold, and my spiritual resources drained away. Almost overnight, I found myself out in the cold, banished without rhyme or reason from the warm hearth that I was beginning to believe was my spiritual birthright. At first, I thought it was merely some temporary setback, and I would return once more to the cosy fireside. But as the months passed by, the cold was clothed with an ever-deepening darkness, and I was assailed by hordes of marauding distractions that cut and thrust at my mind from the inside. In spite of all this, I kept up the daily time that you insisted I should give to prayer, though frankly, my heart wasn't in it. I must admit, quite frankly, that in recent weeks I've been finding excuse after excuse to escape from the prayer that was once my heaven, but is now my hell. I still lead the prayer groups, but I, who was once their mainspring and inspiration, feel like an outsider. I do hope I can hear from you very soon. With every good wish, please pray for me. James Robertson Peter's reply came by return of post. Dear James, thank you so much for your long-awaited letter. I already guessed the predicament that you were in. Take it from me. Everything has not ended. Indeed, it's only just beginning. In short, you've just come through what is sometimes called first fervor. Everyone must go through this particular phase in their spiritual development if they're going to come to know and experience the fullness of love for which they crave. When anyone encounters the love of God for the first time, they are understandably moved and they respond accordingly. But this does not mean that they are instantly changed into saints. If you read the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles, you will see that even after they encountered the love of God in Jesus, the Apostles were not instantly changed from sinners into saints. Despite their first enthusiasm, far from it, as you will see if you read carefully. Unlike magic, love does not bring about instant change. The effects of original sin are such that even the love of God needs time and continual human cooperation for a person to be changed, to be changed from the surface to the very ground of their being. What happened to the first apostles happened also to the first Christian converts who followed them. First enthusiasm was followed by a much longer purification to prepare them for full union with Christ, in with and through whom they would experience true Christian contemplation. The ostentatious outpourings of first fervor are easily identifiable. The profound inner purification is not and that's why it came to be called mystical, from the Greek word meaning unseen, invisible, or secret. Hence the expressions mystical purification, mystical prayer, mystical contemplation, and the mystic way. That is why St. John of the Cross insists that after first enthusiasm or first fervor, the first fervor that you have just been experiencing, a long mystical purification must destroy within you all that keeps God's love out. There are four main stages in a person's prayer life. Juvenile prayer, adolescent prayer, adult prayer, and perfect prayer. 
At the juvenile stage, a person is very insecure and lacks confidence in themselves and in God. So they tend to choose to live in a stable and secure world. It is the world of prescribed prayers, learned by heart or read from a book. It is the world of set formulas and well-tried devotional exercises. The adolescent stage follows if and when a believer decides to make their own the faith that they have imbibed with their mother's milk. The world of the adolescent is less predictable and more exciting. Sensing that God is calling them onward, they respond by searching for him in an ever-deepening prayer experience. Fervor Spiritual cocksureness and pride characterize the makeup of the adolescent, although they're usually only aware of their fervor. Traditionally, the experience of the adolescent took place behind the closed doors of an interior mental prayer. In more recent years, many have been passing through this stage in the company of others as members of prayer groups. You have combined both. The moment of truth comes when first fervor comes to an end and a believer finds him or herself deprived of all feeling in their prayer life. It's sad to say it, but the vast majority give up serious personal prayer at this point because their most recent experience conditioned them to associate faith with feeling or the tangible awareness of God's presence with his actual presence. If they only knew it, God has just taken a new initiative and drawn them closer to himself than ever before. However, this new, spiritual, mystical presence of God seems like absence to the adolescent whose previous experience of him was almost entirely sensual. The days of adolescence are now over, never to return again. This is the beginning of adult prayer. The new world in which the believer finds himself is the environment that enables him to become an adult by daily learning to give without receiving and to love without feeling that love being returned. If you think about it for a moment, you'll realize that this is the only way a person can become a perfect lover. The love that is always returned in kind must remain forever suspect till it receives nothing in return and yet goes on giving. This is the beginning of true mystical prayer. The great spiritual writers make it clear that the beginner who perseveres will be stripped of all feeling and fervor and will be given the opportunity to become a perfect and selfless lover. Naturally, the bounty hunter, who is only looking for exciting and exhilarating experiences, will pack up serious personal prayer altogether at this stage. Throughout the ages, Christian tradition has given various names to this painful period in the spiritual journey. For some, it is the desert, the wilderness. For others, it is the house of self-knowledge, the prayer of faith, or the dark night of the soul. All these different expressions are used by Christian tradition to convey the meaning and implication of the challenge with which the gospel confronts a person who wants to become a perfect follower of Christ. The challenge is this. Do you want to be identified with the full human being, the perfect adult who emerged from the tomb on the first Easter day? Do you want to experience the love that Christ experienced in his resurrection and share it with others? If so, then you must be prepared to share in his self-sacrificial life, in his death too, and even in his descent into hell. It literally means that. Anyone can follow Christ when he's working miracles, turning water into wine, handing out free food and drink. It's not difficult to be his disciple when you can see him curing the sick, giving sight back to the blind, and even raising the dead. But how many can follow him into the desert to suffer hunger, thirst, loneliness, and temptation? How many are prepared to carry a cross behind him, to follow him to Calvary? 
to descend into the very bowels of evil with him. Juveniles can't. Adolescents can't either. It takes an adult to do that. Or rather, an adolescent becomes an adult by doing that. Well, that'll have to do for the moment. I'm very busy at the moment putting a new roof on my cottage. But I'll write again soon, because I have a lot to say to you. For the moment, keep up the daily quality time for prayer, as you did before, and keep your heart's attention fixed upon God as best you can, using the prayer of the heart. Now is the time when you must learn to give without counting the cost, to love without receiving in return, so that your love may be strengthened and deepened in such a way that you may come to know and experience the height and depth and the length and breadth of God's love, which surpasses the understanding. With every good wish, Peter. I put Peter's letter down and sat back to think over its implications. (laughs) He certainly didn't beat about the bush. It was straightforward, clear, and to the point. I knew what he was saying was right, although his implications wounded my pride. Here was I, a supposed serious searcher in my mid-thirties, and I had only just passed through my first fervour. Just because my prayer life had been filled with unction, I thought that I was about to scale Mount Carmel when I had not even penetrated the foothills at its base. I thought I could trace my spiritual progress to the seventh mansion of St. Teresa's interior castle when I hadn't so much as crossed the drawbridge. I loved to read about the loftiest experiences of the Christian mystics, and I had the arrogance to identify them with my own. I fancied myself as a spiritual guru and loved to advise and guide others. I blushed mentally as I thought of some of the patronizing advice I'd given to others who had been journeying for years in the mystic way that I hadn't even known about until now. In the last few months, I was deeply depressed at what appeared to be my failure in prayer and my weaknesses of character that were beginning to come to the surface. My continual temptation was to think that I was wasting my time in prayer, and I kept wanting to pack it all in and lose myself in my work. There at least I would be able to see my efforts rewarded by tangible success. If I couldn't be blamed in the past then I could be and would be blamed in the future if I didn't take full advantage of my friendship with Peter. Thank God for Peter. Even his brief letter gave me grounds for renewed confidence. It was quite evident that he knew exactly what he was talking about. I immediately wrote another letter thanking him for explaining so clearly my present predicament and expressing my disappointment when I realized that at my age, I was only just emerging out of spiritual adolescence. Peter's reply came a week later. Dear James, thank you for your honest reaction to my letter. I did not in any way mean to be offensive, and I hope you've not taken it that way. I was only explaining your predicament as clearly as I could. You see, spiritual adolescence has nothing to do with age. You may be in your thirties, your forties, your fifties, or whatever, but you still have to pass through it if you want to enter into spiritual maturity. It's the same with human psychological development, too. You can be psychologically a juvenile or an adolescent at any age. If a person is going to attain a relative degree of maturity, then they have to pass through the preceding stages, no matter whether they are twenty-two or 82. No one can become an adult without first passing through their adolescence. I know I have fobbed you off in the past when you've asked me to talk about mystical prayer, but I only did this because I saw no point in discussing matters with you of which you had no present experience. However, 
You have now, whether you realize it or not, already experienced the beginning of the mystic way, and so I won't fob you off any longer. In fact, please be encouraged to come out and see me as soon as possible. Would there be any chance of coming out maybe the second week in March? Meanwhile, read the practical advice in the little book How to Pray that I gave you before you left. Best wishes, Peter. Many years later, I found another book entitled Wisdom from the Christian Mystics that was a great help to me. This was, of course, not surprising, because among other things, it contained twelve major talks on prayer given by Peter at a Lenten mission that he was asked to give in central London. Only five years ago, he was no longer the young man whom I met all those years ago, but I was so pleased that he was able to stay with me and my wife for a few days in the New Forest in Hampshire before he returned to his hermitage on the island of Calvay, and even more pleased that he is still my friend, but most of all, my spiritual mentor, who I know will never let me down. This concludes Episode 10, Learning How to Love, from Wisdom from the Western Isles, The Hermit, narrated by its author, David Torkington. To hear and or to download other episodes from this series, as well as hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com, or you can find it inside the Discerning Hearts free app, as well as on the Discerning Hearts YouTube channel. The music performed in this episode was by Catholic concert pianist Vincent Bellington, and the audio production of the program was produced and edited by Bobby Torkington. We hope that if this program has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, and if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation which is fully tax-deductible to help support the efforts of Discerning Hearts to bring listeners around the world freely spiritual formation of this kind. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us once again for more from Wisdom from the Western Isles, The Hermit, with David Torkington.